This week on Maker Update, a project that hits all the right notes, 3D printing with sawdust, ramen noodle knife scales, pizza factories, typesetting, and questionable angle grinder tips from Jimmy DeResta. Hello and welcome back to Maker Update. I'm Tyler Weingartner and it's been a few weeks and I missed you all. I'm hoping that your summer is getting off to a great start and maybe, just maybe, you're able to see your friends and maker pals again. We've got a great show lined up for you, so let's check out the Project of the Week. It's been a long time since I've seen the Tom Hanks movie Big, but if you're going to build a project from the film, it's going to be one of two things. Either it's this guy or the giant floor piano from the Toy Store scene. And clearly, Frederick Taché feels the same way. Over on Instructables, he shares his plans for building a rugged, affordable, and expandable floor piano, complete with light-up keys. The frame for each key is built from Baltic birch plywood, and the keys are made from a solid piece of thick acrylic plastic. The contact circuit is made from conductive fabric on both the base and the underside of the keys. You step on a key, the circuit closes, and a note is played. Pretty simple stuff. And what's more, there's no moving parts, so there's fewer things that can go wrong with it. The real cleverness is in the software. There's a master Arduino Mega managing the entire installation, and each octave in the set also has its own Arduino Mega to process all the keys. You can build this with as little as a single octave, or expand it up to eight octave pads. As you add more keys, the master Arduino assigns a new I2C address to the new pad and adapts the notes accordingly. Even with the price of lumber these days, the project is still fairly affordable at $300 per octave. As the world begins to emerge from quarantine and the idea of celebrating in public with other people becomes less dangerous, this is the perfect project for that sort of gathering. You can find circuit diagrams, Arduino code, and woodworking plans for this project over on his Instructables page. Now for the news, the 3D printing company Desktop Metal is creating a new process for 3D printing using sawdust. The project is called Forest, and unlike conventional 3D printed wood, which is really just sawdust particles embedded in PLA filament, this is similar to selective laser sintering or other powder-based printing processes. Each layer of sawdust is deposited and then a binder is sprayed to join the particles into the object. The resulting prints can be sanded, stained, and the sawdust can even be dyed to simulate wood grain. Their goal is to provide a second-hand use for sawdust left over from traditional wood manufacturing. This looks pretty promising, and I hope there's a future to it. More projects! On Instructables, I found this gorgeous animatronic Skeksis from the Dark Crystal Age of Resistance by C.O. Hillway. She calls it simple, but there's a lot of movement here giving life to this character. The entire head moves, the jaw opens and closes, and there's some eye movement as well. The movements are controlled by a pair of microbit boards. One within the character to drive the servos, and the other is in a remote control box to control the animations using a couple of potentiometers. And it's all made of recycled cardboard. This one's gorgeous and a lot of fun. Check it out. A while back, we mentioned Ian Hubert's lazy tutorial series for Blender on this show. It turns out that each one of those tutorials was pulled from a massive CG film he's been working on for the past few years called Dynamo Dream. And he's just released the first chapter of it. I know this isn't the sort of project we normally talk about here, but this film is an incredible testament to what can be accomplished using free, open source software. He makes heavy use of camera tracking to blend live actors with CG elements, and it's easy to get lost in which parts are practical and which are digital. Okay, that's probably a digital element. Meanwhile, Blender as a software package has a lot to offer for more traditional types of making. There's really powerful digital sculpting tools for 3D printing or CNC design, a video editor, and more. And it's getting easier and easier to learn with every release. Peter Brown is always eager to answer questions you've never thought to ask. Questions like, can you dye ramen noodles? 
Peter uses a stabilizing resin with dyes to saturate the noodles with resin before casting them in clear casting resin to make knife scales from them. If you weren't already familiar with the difference between stabilizing and casting resins and how to use them, there's a lot of tips to pick up in this video and maybe make some ridiculous knife scales for your own projects. Also on YouTube, I saw this video for a whimsical Rube Goldberg style pizza factory from Joseph's Machines. This certainly isn't a practical way to make a pizza, but I love how each ingredient gets its own mechanism to deliver it, and they're all powered by this toy train just driving in circles. Every phase of it gets more ridiculous, like this comb to spread the sauce, or the ferris wheel to deliver the olives. If we're being honest though, this pizza needs way more cheese. But it's a fun video and a great project. Now for some tips and tools. Last week, Donald shared his cool tools video about solid core jumper wires. These are great, but they've got one problem. They're color coded by length and not by function. A while back, I made this video from Make Magazine based on a tip by Charles Platt on how to make your own jumpers from solid core wire. These are not only the right length, but also the right color. That way positive voltage is on the red wires, grounds are on black, or whatever color code is gonna help you make sense of your circuit. Jimmy Duresta just released his video on how he uses angle grinders for cutting metal. The first thing you'll notice is the way he grips the guard with his finger just a few millimeters away from the cutting disc. It certainly looks dangerous, but he claims this gives him better control over the cut. But instead of keeping up this habit, he designs a finger loop for the grinder that he then welds onto the guard. It allows him to control the cut in the same way, but with his finger safely away from the cutter. As a bonus, the finger loop also doubles as a tool hanger. It's not a refined product, but just a reminder that these are your tools to modify to best work with your needs. As makers, we're often designers as well, and sometimes it's tough to find just the right font for a project. But what if you could make your own? On the Craftsman Steady Crafting YouTube channel, he shows a process I'd never heard of using a free service called Calligrapher. It's a delightfully simple process. Select what letter sets you want in your font, print out the template sheets, and then write in your letters. You then scan or photograph your sheets and upload them to the service. He then shows a bunch of different ways of designing your letters, cutting and pasting from old fonts, designing in Procreate, or even photographing gummy letters. And the payoff of seeing his font work is just fantastic. Finally, we have a tip from Noe Ruiz and Adafruit on milling out mechanical keycaps out of wood. These keycaps will be for the lemon macro keypad he designed a while back. The tolerances needed to make these keycaps work are obviously very tight, so precision is going to matter a lot. This video is mostly about his toolpath strategy in Fusion 360, and even though I've been working in this software a lot, there was still plenty for me to learn. And the result of having these wooden keycaps looks really satisfying. For this week's DigiKey Spotlight, we've got an oldie but a goodie a helpful explanation of both the right-hand rule and left-hand rule of electromotive forces in charged conductors. In reality, these tools are just a setup for explaining the phenomena of back EMF in DC motors. This is a force created as a byproduct of the motor rotation, and it's part of what limits the speed of a motor. The faster the motor spins, the more back EMF is generated. There's still a lot I don't know about DC motors, so this video is pretty revealing to me about just how deceptively complex their design really is. And that is gonna do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for watching. Looking back, we had a bunch of really fun and silly projects to showcase this week. I guess it just goes to show that not every project needs to be a super useful piece of shop furniture. And sometimes it's just fun to make something that makes you smile. Big thanks to DigiKey Electronics for making this show possible. If you enjoyed the show, give us a thumbs up, hit subscribe, and sign up for the Maker Update email list so you never miss a show. Take care, and I'll see you soon.